Hello, good morning, Uganda, and welcome to this special edition of the NTV Morning Show. And today, we are looking at the 2023-2024 financial budget. And, um, of course, uh, it's the biggest budget we've had as a country in Uganda. We're talking about over 52 trillion Uganda shillings. And uh, there are a number of questions that are, you know, uh, arising from the different spaces and sectors of the economy. But the most important thing is whether this budget is actually speaking to the needs and aspirations of the average Ugandan. And uh, today um, on the show, we are looking at some of those key points and areas where, of course, this budget could be speaking to those aspirations. Uh, but most importantly, the business community, the SME docket, which uh, many have attested to that it's actually the engine for growth. Now, in the studio, I have uh, special guests that are going to help us dissect and distill uh, some of these key aspects to try and understand uh, how this budget affects you uh, in your different areas, where, uh, area where you sit, whether as a business person, as a household, or as a person who is actually doing business across the border. Now, with me in the studio, I have uh, Rita. Uh, Rita, you're most welcome to the show. Thank you. Very good. And then I have Eunice. Uh, Eunice, we're happy to have you on the show. Thank you. And uh, Julius, Julius Mukonda, you're most welcome to the show. Thank you. Very good. I'll start with you, Rita. Um, the key thing, every time the budget is read, there's, you know, that uh, anxiety, anticipation, uh, and much expectation, especially from that average person, the average Ugandan. Um, in your view, do you think uh, the budget that was read yesterday speaks to the aspirations and the needs of that person? Thank you very much. As you said, um, this is uh, one of our biggest budgets ever as a, a nation. But also just to break it down for the person you're talking about, a budget is a projection of expenditure, even at our you know, small individual household levels. And of course, our government has put up this budget um, in anticipation of satisfying the needs of the citizens. So there is that much that can be done on the side of government, but also what can we do on our side to achieve this budget? That's where the mindset that we need to come up with. It's not something somebody sitting there, government is sitting there, and we are sitting here and we expect government to deliver 100%. Having said that, this is a budget from the pronouncements made yesterday by the Minister of Finance, it's a budget that you can see pushing us towards recognizing our challenges, towards recognizing the fact that we need to recover from one, the COVID effect, to the expenditures that we've been having and we've been talking about for a very long time in terms of um, uh, expenditures like public uh, expenditures, uh, borrowing, large borrowings, but also looking at some of the hemorrhages and leakages within our budgets. Um, and all that, if well managed, it will definitely address the needs of the common person. The other thing that also, which I think the common person or the citizens should be happy about are the areas of human capital development, because that's where most of our challenges are, issues of education, issues of health. And from where I sit, where I, 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 I engage most for women and girls, this is something that definitely will benefit the local person. When we have medical doctors and their issues addressed, the ripple effect for women and girls, you can't imagine that. Because as our viewers may know that Uganda is one of the countries with the highest maternal mortality, the highest infant mortality. And some of these issues are very basic issues. Issues of blood in the hospital, issues of the, um, the three effects of the maternal, when can I access maternity uh, services? How far is the hospital? Is the doctor, nurse, or service provider actually there? So if money is put in that, then health improves. And once he health improves, then wealth can be created because you'll then be have, uh, you'll be having a more productive uh, society. And finally, the other aspect that I also see um, that it, all Ugandans should be happy about with government is the, the proposal to look at the 
arrears that have accumulated as a result of our people failing to meet their tax obligations. Now, the arrears many times have tied down businesses because while somebody might be willing to, to pay the, the principal, the arrears compound that principal. The interest compound the principal, making the business person now run out of options but eventually close. So the more we close businesses, the less tax base we have and the more challenges we create. So with, with that proposal, and if effectively done, we are going to see more money in the economy. And once there's more money in the economy, then livelihoods will improve. Thank you, Rita. Um, I'll move to you, Eunice. Um, you're from Deloitte, and you know you are the expert in this space, especially of taxation. Um, she raises a very important point, which I want again you to carry forward. Um, the issue of areas, uh, uh, the interest uh, on tax uh, areas. Um, from where you sit, um, one, how do you view this in relation to the business community and their needs at this particular point in time? And then, as you are at it, I want you to, re to also talk about the fact um, that we have picked with from some of the business community uh, that there seem to be a bit of more tax de uh, deepening than actually widening. get to waive interest, yeah. which is a good proposal by government mm -hmm. because it shows that they recognize that uh, these uh, systems of tax collection and the cost of being of doing business, they all communicate to each other. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if suppliers to government haven't been paid yeah. and they're incurring costs in their operation, mm -hmm. they need to be able to get that revenue so that they can be able to offset the tax. Yeah. However, if that is not paid, then they uh, right to present to the tax collector and say, the government hasn't paid me, and you are part of this ecosystem, mm. so I cannot provide, I cannot remit my obligation. Yeah. And so uh, the cost of doing business definitely is high because of interest rates, access to credit, but uh, in the budget, there's been that provision, and ho we're hoping that it will uh, totally be actualized, that there's the focus on investing in the Uganda, where the access to uh, loan facilities uh, uh, have been f funded by UDB, and uh, also the different bits of Emioga. Mm -hmm. Emioga is a very good, uh, it's a very good uh, implementation that the government has really focused on. And right now, 10,000 parishes have received this money at the parish development model. So even from the subsistence level, because it's not just the business, yeah. the parish development model is focused on developing the household. And once the household is able to conduct its business, it may be cottage, mm. they can be able to remit tax mm. because on their sales, they still can include that margin for the tax. Yeah. And so the arrears is a good step mm. by government, yeah. and it's something that can uh, encourage businesses mm. to be able to take advantage of this mm. so that they can be able to continue surviving while the rest are coming up and uh, being able to start the small micro businesses at parish level and be able to contribute to the revenue. Thank you, Eunice. I, I, I like, um, I, and as I bring you in, Julius, I like the fact that, you know, if you look at PDM in, in, in the, you know, prism of having it also contributing to widening the base, because I know one of the reasons why some uh, that are already paying tax uh, have been complaining about is the fact that they feel they are targeted more, and yet there are many outside the tax bracket. So if Mioga can also bring that aspect down to as many Ugandans as possible, I think it can be a good revenue mobilization uh, tool. So, um, Julius, I know there are areas and uh, spaces you're quite passionate about. Uh, of course, one of the aspects that comes to mind is on the area of prudence in expenditure on the side of government. As we do this, because like Rita rightly pointed out, 
this seems to be a budget that is responding to the hard times, the headwinds that you know uh, we are contending with at the moment. So, um, on your part, how would you want government or those responsible, you know, to make a number of these government programs to work? How do you expect them, or how would you want them to behave this financial year? Yeah, I mean. Right, as I said, we, we are, we, I think we are recognizing that we need to address the challenges we are facing mm. as, as, as a country. And the, the, the tax waivers, I think that's, that's very, that's very one of them. Uh, but also to say that we don't have new taxes, uh, uh, stop like stabilize the, the private sector business, like this funding for UDC and, and, and UDP, it's, it's, it's quite important. We have increased, we have increased the money for agriculture. Yes. Uh, we also increase the money of human capital development uh, uh, for health education and uh, health and education. So you're taking the biggest portion of the budget? The, big, the biggest portion of the budget. Okay. Then now the biggest impact in the room is how we're going to deliver this. I think that's, mm. that's very important. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I think I should look forward for is uh, I want to see strength and coordination. And I think that's why the Prime Minister the office is becoming very critical mm. because the job is to oversee government business. I, I really want to see the office of Prime Minister really becoming a bit more, get more strengthened and get more serious on how we run projects in this country and how we deliver in this country. If you are a, 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 a parish and we gave you money for, for PDM and you are underperforming, we need to understand why are you not performing. Is it because of incompetence? Just get out. Let's get the right person to do that. If you do that from the parish and you come up to the ministries, who are these people are running projects, we would definitely be able to deliver. The, the other important element <coughs> is, I think, what I've been talking about it is uh, most accounting officers actually say that money comes late, that they, they don't have this money. Can we ensure that actually money is released to them and in time so that they can be able to execute their programs? Yes. Because it, it, it becomes a cha it's challenging. And in fact, they have, they have said we are incurring domestic areas simply because money is really in the budget, yeah. but when we commit government, we, we don't, we, government doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, release all this money. So we need to ensure that actually money gets to these uh, areas, to, 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 uh, is released to, to accounting what to implement. And there is a good practice in government. In fact, that by the half of the financial year, all development budget has already been released. Yes. So there shouldn't be a reason as to why accounting officers actually cannot implement, uh, implement on time. Uh, the, uh, last that I think is also to strengthen our fiscal discipline <coughs> as, 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 as a government. Uh, <coughs> The whole idea of uh, if there is any shilling that is lost, we need to account for it, and we need to understand why. Uh, we need to strengthen the way we, uh, we, 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 we recover, you know, stolen property. I actually am impressed of late that, uh, you know, you, I'm seeing the IGG, you know, you know very, very aggressive, the, you know, the state house uh, and corruption, in, very aggressive when people are taking resources. We need these cases to be concluded. Mm -hmm. A case should not take a million years to be concluded. It, it, becomes, it becomes a bit meaningless. And, uh, and, and for me, is <coughs> once we have very strong fiscal discipline, yes. we can deliver this budget mm -hmm. in, in its particular form, despite the challenge, of course, that we face as a nation. Mm -hmm. Yes. I hear you. Rita, I'll come back to you. Um, when I look at the target that uh, um, has been given, to URA to collect this year. Mm -hmm. um, I can't help but wonder, you know, given the circumstances, which areas, in your view, uh, would the taxman look to actually realize that target? Because it's fairly aggressive, looking at uh, the previous one. And uh, how can the taxman create a balance between mobilizing the revenue, which we need, because we know that uh, even borrowing, where we pick the money, things are no longer as easy as they used to be in the past, uh, without breaking uh, or killing the cow, if I may say. Well, um, it's a big, big challenge for URA, mm. I must say. Um, I think there was a study done 
and which I think still stands, close to 80% of the taxes of this country is collected in and around Kampala Metropolitan, mm -hmm. yeah. Kampala Wakiso Mukono Mpiji, right? Yeah. As of now, I think we have about 127 districts or so. Yes, I, I, I lost uh, count. it's around there. <laughs> At least the last time, uh, it's around. So, if we are going to have a tax collection based on, let's say, about 10 districts, let's just say 10 districts, yes. and you have over 100 districts yes. that are not significantly contributing to the tax. The other challenge is that they are going to squeeze the few so hard that this few might end up dropping off in the tax bracket. Having said that, on the other hand, what my colleagues have said is that, well, URA may do their best. How are we spending this that they are collecting? Because this that they are collecting needs to be spent so well that it creates more tax avenues. And until we, we connect these dots, we'll continue blaming URA, we'll continue demanding more from them, not knowing they are reliant on how we are spending. The other thing that of course, we said this is like, you know, a, a budget that is setting us for takeoff. Yeah. We had initially said we had taken off, but it seems now we are at the takeoff stage. Yeah. So this budget is setting us for takeoff, and we need to understand what are some of the things that will make us take off. Gladly, we've looked at human capital development. Yeah. Most of the countries that have developed, you talk about the Singapore's and all that. Human capital development is one of them. Invest in people invest in social protection that is when they become productive invest in industrialization so as we move to the second third fourth year and going forward this has to be re-enhanced and even doubled invest in mechanization we are such a proud country to call ourselves agrarian meaning agricultural country the 110 15 districts that are contributing minimally to our tax base. Can we get them? And the, the low hanging fruits for me is our agriculture. We have our beautiful weather, we have rain. Of course, these days it's, you know, haphazard, but it's still much better than many countries. Can we invest in those areas? Otherwise, we'll demand of URA, URA will demand of the few, and that the few might end up going falling back in those who are not in the tax bracket yeah. so there is need to continue thinking of those that URA needs to capture but on the other hand as Jill has said we need our tax expenditure uh, I mean budget expenditure improvement and the prudence in how we spend reducing the linkage uh, the leakages reducing the um, public expenditure honestly i think julius has talked he, he's he's been on these shows more than any of us some of these expenditures we can cut the fleets i'm glad I, I saw the fleets uh, no new cars except for ambulances those are some of the areas um, you have all these public officers and you're saying why does one ministry ha have seven ministers okay we, we need the RDCs but do we need all these districts in the RDCs you know, there are certain things we could just the low hanging fruit and I'm telling you Uganda will be on the takeoff beautiful uh, Yunus, I'll come back to you. Um, of course, like I mentioned earlier, earlier the, there's focus, you know, to mobilize resources domestically. And uh, of course, at the time when uh, there's also appreciation that the cost of living is, is fairly high. I know the central bank governor the other day was giving us hope that actually, much as the prices are up, they are no longer increasing at that high rate 
uh, than they were. And of course, inflation has come down. It's now in single digit from double digit. Um, but uh, the question is, in order for that revenue to be realized domestically, there has to be sales. And uh, with sales, of course, you have aspects of affordability. And we all know cost of living is a challenge to that uh, affordability that we're talking about. Um, in your view, how do you think we can, uh, for lack of a better word, rejig or resuscitate uh, that aspect of, uh, you know, business where demand increases, you know, um, despite the fact that we have this high cost of living, which has kind of dampened demand for those in business. Because if you speak to anyone in business today, if you go to Chikubu or downtown, including the corporates, by the way, they will tell you, sales, sales, sales are an issue. How do we uh, pull out of this, in your view? And do you think the budget is actually speaking to that? Uh, thanks. Uh, it's tough, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll say, mm -hmm. uh, especially for businesses and aspiring business uh, or entrepreneurs. But uh, how we can actually pull out, first of all, government has made uh, moves to promoting export trade yeah. and also the promotion of Buy Uganda, Build Uganda has taken a bit of traction, which is starting to move the focus a bit to, to, to the Ugandan uh, business person or the Ugandan manufacturer. The cost of living has been high, and uh, last year it was higher. So now the, the, the prices are steadily going down. They may not go back to what we had before, but it's definitely, just like inflation has gone down, it's definitely starting to relatively cool off in comparison to last year. Yes, and uh, this, we're hoping that definitely it will encourage people to attempt to invest. Mm -hmm attempt to innovate yeah. because Uganda is ranked high up among the entrepreneurial countries in the world but most of the businesses stop do not see year three or year five yeah. so the fact that yes so the fact that that is there yeah. is hope that you know the cost of living can actually improve now the facilitation of the starter business uh, micro businesses is very important because if someone is beginning a business and then you slap the tax, they've barely made any r revenue. They've barely recognized profits. So it's the focus on government needs to also continue in that area. There is the development of uh, the focus on STEM, science and innovation. And uh, there are several people, the, the several parts of the population. Right now, 10 million people yes. in Uganda have a smartphone according to statistics. Yes. And so we've had several people starting to become self-employed mm. by being by using this technology. Mm. And they're earning money. We have the, the, the bloggers, the people that are doing online marketing. Mm. People are actually doing business using this small device. Yeah. So in order to improve the cost of, uh, first of all, the taxes that are levied on the data charges, mm. uh, have to be friendly enough to encourage even more people to acquire these devices yeah. and sit back and create some sort of business in their homes but still be able to earn an income and support themselves. So there's lots of um, different areas that government needs to look at to be able to improve the cost of living uh, and uh, affordability of these products. The taxation, URA has its targets. <laughs> The, 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 the risks have to, be, um, have to be explored. So we have this target. What is the risk that will not achieve it? And URA has to be able to continuously talk to government. Because if government demands that you have to meet this set goal, figure it out, it, then it doesn't make sense because then they will be stuck. But once they assess the risks and the vulnerabilities, they can have measures to address slowly but to, they'll be able to see projection, uh, uh, traction in the improvement of the cost of living. And we can only hope that the prices will continue to slowly go down so that I the cost you. of living can improve. Great, great, great. Julius, I'll come to you. Um, every time the budget is read, mm -hmm. I'm keen to see how it's aligning to the National Development Plan. Um, in your view, is the 2023-2024 financial budget aligned?
you know, to the National Development Plan 3. Mm -hmm. And uh, or as you do that, um, is the National Development Plan 3 still relevant? Because I imagine it was drafted without COVID in mind and its uh, ramifications. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we have, we must have the National Development Plan, otherwise it would be like a ship without, without the campus. Yeah. So, but this NDP3 was affected by COVID two years down the road, we have not done anything. And no wonder the performance, uh, mid term we said that we had performed at 19 percent. So we had lost, we had lost, we lost so, we lost so much. And we are telling them that I think we'd rather now start developing NDP for let us accept our losses and, and, and plan again because nobody expects this kind of work to, 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 be, to be done. But the NDP3 brought some very good features, really. You have the, the program approach where, uh, you know, sectors <coughs> were stopped from planning in a silo and you come to work together. And, and, and one really very good example is the human capital development. You send a kid to school, it's just not about you providing teachers and scholastic materials. That kid must be immunized, for example. So you need to work with the Minister of Health to ensure that immunization takes place. Uh, the school must have wash, wash facilities, mm -hmm. so you must work with water to make sure that the kid can, the school has, is, has got wash facilities. But also p parents need to be educated the importance of sending both the girl and the boy child to school. Mm -hmm. And then you have the mindset change. So th that kind of, of, uh, of approach is, is very key to, be, to ensure that you have the, the best capabilities out of any, uh, any, any human being. So that, 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 that is very, very, very important. Uh, so the biggest challenge I think NDP is facing is that uh, the number of core projects under NDP, most of them had not been, had not been, had not been achieved. Again, because of the two-year uh, crisis that, uh, that, 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 that we are in. Uh, but also NDP, if you look at, uh, in terms of what, for example, the URA, what she was, she was talking about, is that you, you want to, to have uh, around above 15% of tax to, the, to, the, to the GDP. But, you know, you can only get this tax from a cow that you are feeding so well. I think that's, that's very clear. And really, I, I cannot bash URA. It is one of the best performing institutions. They have never collected money less than the previous year, yeah. even during COVID. True. These guys collected more, mm -hmm. so you, you can imagine. And I think their performance has been above, above 95%. And I was telling people, if your kid comes home with a, a, with a report of 95%, you slaughter a chicken mm -hmm. for them. Because the, the performance and a number of innovations there. Recently, they said is e receipt. Mm -hmm. So they are like, now, if you don't want to write a receipt, at least you can have an app and, and, and give somebody a somebody receipt. So the, the, the more you try to, to bring everybody on board. But also is that I think for me is we, we really need to be candid to ourselves and say who should be in the tax bracket and who should not be in the tax bracket. Because if you have a small kiosk, you know, the presumption tax, and they look at it and say you, you, you pay 100,000 shillings per year. They think the capital stock in that case is like 300,000. But my friend here with the 500 cows, you are not in taxation brackets. You are not at all. If you bring a, a truck full of Matoki every week, you are not in taxation in a tax bracket at all. Mm. So we really need to come now to say, okay, who should get into it? That is when we can actually hit the target of having our tax to GDP ratio. Because we have a potential of 21% tax to GDP, and we are still stagnating at 13%. So otherwise, me and you, you pay pay, when you get out the mineral water bottle, you still pay VAT on it. Now we are going to add another 75 shilling on, on, on the bottle. If you want to start a company, I mean, it's, it becomes so heavy, so heavy on you. And, 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 when, and when you ask a question of how can you increase the demand, you can only increase the demand when people have money in their pockets. True. <laughs> so, and Effective people, demand. Yes. Yeah. One of the things I think NDP should also look at is the question of markets. When South Sudan had just opened, even the corporates left their offices and they wanted to go and trade, simply because there was the market. We need to invest in identifying markets for our products. And this, even this budget, one of the things, the biggest 
element they can really address is the issue of markets. You can't wake up in the morning and tell you, oh, Kenya no longer wants your milk. Kenya no longer wants your eggs. Are the Kenyans the only people who eat eggs and drink milk? You ask yourself. South Sudan has even now stopped taking our, our portion. Our portion. Mm -hmm. I, I ask myself, even South Sudan can refuse to take our portion. So we need to address, address the issue of markets, understand what do our customers want. Do they want, uh, I was saying, squared watermelon? Then we come here and, and, do, and tear, tear narrow, because that's what they're supposed to do. Do uh, what the customer wants, and, 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 and I know this country is that if you tell farmers, we need a squared watermelon, and you provide them with the city. They will do that because we have the and best the environment. Vanilla, the days of vanilla, yes. Everything that comes, up, people, everything jump that comes on. people jump on it. Yeah. So you must address the markets. What do the Japanese want? The Europeans? They are growing macadamia. Yes, exactly. They, whatever comes, I'm telling you, they will do it simply because market drives production. Mm. But if we want to stay here and then we just produce, uh, my friend. Uh, produce for uh, yeah. I mean we won't get there these things need to need a plan these things need a strategy mm -hmm. because we're in a competitive uh, in a competitive Con environment. environment the Kenyans also have their milk we have their milk so we need to identify where else we can sell the things and I was telling them that if I was the president the first thing I the first key performance indicator for me would tell every ambassador to give them a target of how many products and the value of Ugandan products of Uganda should be sold in the country where you are seated. That's my first key performance indicator. And I can tell you, we can be able to do that. And I would tell even my friend, the ED of Uganda Export Promotion Board, how many of Ugandan products have we exported abroad? And how much, how many new markets have we got? So that we start this, this conversation. and. It can actually even help us to put money in the in people's pockets. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, <coughs> we'll come back to you. Um, we talked about the main winners. Mm. You know, the winners in this budget, and it's clearly uh, human capital development, mm. health, education. Mm. Um, in your view, who are the losers? In my view, who are the losers? Losers. In this, um, I really don't see big losers in this. As I said, this is, um, you know, a budget that is meant for takeoff. It's almost, it sounded yesterday, I felt like the minister had pressed a panic button. And in doing that, we need to embrace and understand that we are in it together. However, what I see, given the conditions that um, URA has to face, For them to raise that money, the tax base is not going to come out from nowhere. It's yeah. still the same people who have been in that tax bra bracket to raise that money. Therefore, they are going to come and come aggressively. Yeah. And that could be, or those are the people who might be the biggest losers. Yeah. As she said earlier on, if the risks and the risk analysis and mitigation um, strategies are not properly put in place, we might see more people falling out of the tax bracket. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I also see, um, a number of ministries may or will not be able to meet their mandate. I'll give an example, our line ministry, I work with women and women's organization. And, and our line ministry is Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. And that ministry has women, children, youth, disability, workers, labor. Now that, and the elderly. Now that ministry is actually the entire Uganda. It's cost cutting. But you're talking about mindset change, you're talking about PDM, you're talking about Emi Yoga, and all these are supposed to be monitored, supervised, evaluated by this ministry, and also the mindset, mindset change aspect. 
Now, this ministry, the budget, is merely 20%. And what is the 20% for? I want to believe most of it is for either salaries and administration at the bare minimum. So there are a number of ministries who are going to lose in terms of meeting their mandate. I don't know what they will do in the manifesto week for next year. But I think the most painful thing is that it will go back to the ordinary person. Because these people will sit and get their salaries. But what they were supposed to benefit from these ministries, they will not see. Mm. I hear you. I hear you. Jones, I'll come to you um, on the note of optimism. Um, in your view, what is likely to drive growth in 2023, 2024? Where are those green shoots, you know, that are likely to, to be the anchors for growth and therefore to support all these other aspects, taxation and the rest? have those that will that may contribute immediately and those that may contribute in a relatively long term longer term the first area is the focus on industrialization and training of the youth skilling centers have been set up across the over 18 and the youth being our largest portion of the population is something we need to focus on because they're very energetic they're very ambitious, and they, they, they go for what they would like to. And these opportunities are there. And uh, so the optimism there is that focus on that portion of the population to grab and educate them and train them so that they have enough skills that are required for our industrialization. That's developing the human capital. The training uh, has covered over 20,000, and about 6,000 are still ongoing. But the beauty about it is the training is short term, and then they should be able to plug in into the different industries that are available. Or government should provide those frameworks for placement for the youth. So that is definitely optimism, and the youth are urged to take advantage of this opportunity because it's very subsidized. They uh, indicated that the ghetto has already taken, the finance minister indicated that they already, and when, when, when he said that, that was a very good thing, because it should be, the others should follow. Yeah, and then we grow skills in that area. Then the other part is uh, the export trade, the, the focus also on uh, uh, improving our access to global markets is very important. It has been ongoing before, but it's not just about improving our access to the global markets. Remember, standardization must be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, like Julia said, if we are providing, producing square watermelon, mm. it should be standardized. It's said that the one thing that makes Ugandan products fail in the global market yeah. is there is never standardization. Standard. And uh, that is a major focus. But also the procedures at the Export Promotion Board for someone to get an export license. They should not be a six-month-long or a year-long or a month-long application. I have uh, had several friends in the business who have been trying to get these licenses, and the frustration they've expressed. And, you know, so when someone who's attempting gets very frustrated, then you who even is dreaming about it, you're afraid to even yeah. try. Yes, yeah, so stim uh, uh, Improving these processes is very important. So there's optimism there. There's optimism in uh, government tightening its implementation and uh, auditing uh, the public service. Currently, they've uh, engaged the education management system. There is one that tracks teachers to prevent absentees and also cut back on that expense. And then they put a refreeze, uh, freeze on uh, recruitment which will also be lifted after they've done the audits. So there's optimism there. People will be paid when they're actually doing the work because that expenditure also cuts back on our budget. Value for money. Yeah, our value for money. Then also for the health, uh, it may be short term, but the remittances for interns is very important. And the fact that government has provided for that so that now they can open up and get more people into the health sector 
needs, uh, I believe those different areas are areas for us to be optimistic about, not forgetting the parish development model. We can be very optimistic that they will work, but as citizens we have to work with the government and uh, make sure that these planned monies are implemented and accounted for. Because once we lose them in the pipeline, we cannot realize. And you have to underline the accounting for. Yes, yeah. that's very, very important. Mm. So there is lots of optimism, okay. yeah, in spite of uh, the debts that we have to fund. Mm -hmm. There are areas where you can see the light. And everybody who is able to understand the budget mm -hmm. can plug into those areas because there are opportunities for everyone. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Julius, uh, your optimism? Oh, sure, 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 sure. Uh, I think that my, I'm very optimistic because this country, our challenge is not because we lack money. Yeah. No. I, our challenge actually is how to spend the money. Because mm. money is out there, but... And it, it, it sounds funny, but... I mean, Nita and I know these things when a donor sends you money and you try to spend and you just can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you, do you have you, issues of absorption? You, you know, you get issues of absorption. Mm. So, and, and I... I see this in the in, in, in government that we have money, but you are spending it. So it's it's, it's it's an opportunity that as government, and I've seen now Minister of Finance really trying to do that. One of them is have an integrated bank project. This business of somebody flying in through the window with a concept note of a project is over. There is now a, a bank where projects are and those that are ready to be funded. Good. That is very important. They have now put a very serious uh, appraisal team so that if whatever comes in into the bank has already been appraised properly and nicely. So you, you, you can see, yes, this is where we are supposed to go. The other element, I think, is the saving part. The minister said that we're going to start buying bonds using our mobile money. Okay. And, uh, and I was like, wow, now that means my mother now can also buy own part of government and buy a bond of 10K on our mobile money. I think it's very good because it increases mm. financial inclusion and also it increases uh, the saving culture mm. uh, culture in this country. So I'm really looking forward to see how Bank of Uganda should lower this because we've been talking about this for quite some time. And that now we're in this situation, I think Bank of Uganda really should speed up this particular process. The Islamic Bank is another area that we have talked about. Regulations need to come out very quickly so that we can uh, start the Islamic, Islamic banking. Uh, another big opportunity, of course, uh, is on the parish development model. We can't, we can't forget about that. And I really tell my fellow Ugandans that uh, the parish model money, the Minyoga 100 million money, the money we are spending on national medical stores, over half a trillion, half a trillion of it, the money we are spending on roads and boreholes and irrigation, these things don't belong to politicians. And I agree with the, our, our Inspector General of Government that politicians and technologists don't die in our hospitals, they die somewhere else. These hospitals are ours. This, we, are the ones who, we are the ones who get into these, uh, these hospitals. So seeing government really taking a serious approach to ensure that the service delivery is done, that's another, another element. We, we are funding UDC. We, we are funding UDB. We have the small and minimum enterprise recovery fund. I mean, and UDB is, is, is dying to, to, get, to end out this money. People are not mm. taking it. The, the, the small and enterprise fund money is there, and we, we are not doing it. So the, 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 the whole idea is that the things are in place, but the inability for us, to, we need to work out a model on, I mean, like Centennial has found out that if you can't have a land title, you can still be a very good client. If you come in a group, we can only give you money. And people still do that. Mm. So I think the mindset of us saying that somebody must have a land title to access a loan, we should go away and look for better innovations and, and better approaches and methods on how we can actually make sure that people can access these, uh, these, uh, these products. Because, of course, again, you don't want to give somebody a loan and they buy a one-way a one ticket out of, <laughs> out of, out of Entebbe. You need to, to strengthen that. I see Bank of Uganda being capitalized, uh, and also government committee itself to pay back the debt on Bank of Uganda. Mm -hmm. And it sends a signal across, not only here in Uganda, but across, across the globe, mm -hmm. that you have a strong institution, mm -hmm. that it is capable of dealing with risks, it is capable of managing the economy. Uh, we have seen inflation coming down, you know, and, uh, 
and to me is those are the those are serious signals that the, the economy really is now at the, at, at the take off stage mm. uh, of course uh, I, I, I believe for me is that yes we did that but uh, there was a low hanging fruits of increasing production of agriculture and we have washed away uh, uh, inflation so uh, yes, uh, a number of things really are, are, are in this budget, opportunities are there. I look upon the private sector really to, uh, to take advantage of these, of these uh, innovations. Uh, she talked about the tax waivers. This is serious. You know, you, know you've, you can't pay the principal. Then how will you pay the penalty and the, and the interest? And it was not your own making. The situation happened. So really for me, is, that's a very fantastic and uh, marvelous gesture on the part of government for the private sector really to recover. Uh, if actually I was them, I would put them and say, please, and I, I told them, I said, I could tell the private sector, please come and declare what you are trying to, what you have not, you have not paid. Mm -hmm. Come and declare it. And after I've declared it, then you start paying. Mm -hmm. Because even I know there are those who are not like even to pay mm -hmm. the principal because they closed it long, 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 long time ago. So yes, that's, that's the, the kind of feeling that you get as you, you read this budget. Uh, and I'm really, really hopeful that we can really execute it uh, the way uh, we want. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, Julius. Uh, viewers, I'd like to remind you, this is a special edition of uh, Morning at NTV. And um, we are looking at the 2023-2024 financial year budget, uh, trying to look at, um, you know, aspects of allocation, the winners, uh, and of course those, uh, I don't want to, to use the word losers, uh, maybe the challenge mm. would, be, would sound a lot more it's diplomatic. More, it's more positive. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh. And the sentiment coming out. They are taxing the, 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 agents, the bank agents. Eh? Okay. <laughs> they are taxing. Yes. We will hold next for the bank agents. Mm, and true. I remember we were fighting with them when we were with the mobile money yes. agents and then they said, ah, don't tax them. Mm -hmm. They also come to the, the tax bracket. Well, uh, it's good to expand. To expand. Yes. Than deepen. Yeah. Than deepen. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah, and we'd like to thank our partners. ABSA, Deloitte, uh, for supporting uh, this interface that we are having this morning. Now, the elephant in the room, also, especially for the business community here, is the issue of domestic areas. And I want us to speak about that. I don't know whether to start with you, Rita. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, yes, domestic areas. And it's the same thing we've been talking about, yes. the ability for us to be able to connect the dots. Yeah. The, the, the effects and the counter effects of our actions. Yeah. So we, we, we borrow, uh, or at times we even consume, and we don't pay. So the people who are not now paying to URA, majority might be those who are actually victims of our actions. So um, I think if government decides to put money in repaying of the debts, the domestic debts, that money is going to come back into the economy. Yeah. Yeah. But also, I think yesterday the minister was very clear, the president was very clear, this borrowing thing has to stop, stop in one way or another. Of course, borrowing, we can never stop. But it has to be, I think, well thought out, well, uh, um, with a, a plan of borrowing, what it's going to do and how it's going to be, you know, but I think that we've agreed, at least we, we can say we as a country have agreed that the borrowing is not helping us as we, it ought to be. If, I think, Julius, if I'm right, almost 50% of this budget, as it stands, is for paying yeah, debts. Yeah. This is the biggest budget item. So you, at the beginning I said that the budget is a, what, a projection of expenditure. So before you even start spending, you have to first pay the other person. So we are, we are left with half that budget. But if we, if, if we pay the domestic areas, the beauty is the money is reinvested. I, there has been a lot of talk that we need to also rethink about um, our investors who come here. We have quite big investors here, but where are the profits? Most of these profits are repatriated. That's an area I think probably the minister and his team in finance need to think about. 
should we facilitate our local investors whose money remain in the economy I want to assume majority of it remains in the economy than having the investors who at times we don't have control over and repatriate most of the profits and yet in our books we'll capture them as you know the economy is growing and all that but most of this money is not ours so paying back the debt the internal debt especially I think should be a matter of urgency so that it is um, reinvested in the economy. I hear you. Um, Yonis, I'll come to you on this. Um, you're the risk expert in this space. And uh, I want to look at the budget implementation, 2023-2024. Uh, How do you, you know, view the aspect of debt vis-a-vis -vis the performance of this budget? Well, the, our debt is big, that's for sure. And uh, if you have, uh, for instance, if you've borrowed money, I'll use an example to start a business, you're going to start paying interest on the debt before you ever realize profit. And uh, similarly, with the government, we do need to be able to close off that debt. It is very important. If we are to really focus or to manage it, if we are to really focus on the growth, because most of the money the funds will get, as we are funding, uh, say, the development on this side, the domestic areas are still there. The people that we're trying to fund have not been paid by the government, and so they cannot contribute to these big projects in the different programs. So we will be stuck at that point. They cannot access credit because uh, they are unable, uh, since they've not yet been able to close off on, on uh, the different loans that they have. And so managing the, the, the risk of debt is something that has to be carefully thought about. Do we require more debt coming in? Is it very important? Can we raise the money here as a nation? I believe we can as, as, as Uganda. Uh, there is the, 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 the anticipation that some of the aid might be cut off because of different political reasons. But that's an opportunity also, even uh, when you use the example of a family. When you have less money, look at the need, not the want. You may want to drive a Pajero, but do you have the money to do it? So what do you need? You need food on the table, you need health, you need water, focus on what we need. Don't go now and live beyond your expenses and borrow money to facilitate this want that you can't sustain. Mm -hmm. So just looking at the family level should be reflective of what the government can do because the family is a core component of, of, of the entire population. And so managing those risks is asking the questions. Is it required? If it is required, where are we going to uh, apportion it? And what are we going to reap? from this apportioning. That assessment needs to be done so that the risk is calculated and managed even when we take on debt. But as of now, I think we need to consider on paying back first. I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> Julius, um, I read you and read you right on the issue of, uh, you know, you're quite passionate about the markets and how this will feed into, you know, supporting the economy, uh, economic activity, business activity here. And uh, there are, I want you to speak to the aspect of the regionalism of our budget. Uh, do you see coherence between what we're doing or what the budget is saying here with, say, Kenya, the Tanzanian budget, and Rwanda? We are far, far, far better off mm. <laughs> than, <laughs> than, 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 than our colleagues. Mm. Uh, you know, even in inflation, I, I, except, except Tanzania, and you can understand it because of their politics in Tanzania and of their governing system in Tanzania. Their debt ratios are still very low, around 36 percent. Uh, inflation in the region, we are still doing well. In, in, in Uganda, a stable exchange rate, we, 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 are still, we are still very good. Prospects of economic growth, Uganda is still, yeah, is, is, is still better. Uh, so really, we, when we compare to, to other countries, we, in terms of our economic management, I think we are still doing well. We are, we are still we are, st we are still we are still doing well. Uh, 
But I think it's, it's also important. There is what you are asked around the, 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 the domestic areas. I think it's, we can bring it out very well also to add what they have said. Mm. We are going to spend pay 200 billion. Our areas are around 4.4 trillion. Okay, yeah. that's, that's what the other general was telling us. Yes. So what signal are you saying? You are, you are sending to the business community. I know banks like Abusa, you walk in with an European of government, they give you money. You go, you purchase things, supply government, because they know your government is going to pay you back. And you pay them. You get your difference, you happy to walk back home. But now I don't think they are going to do that. Because the signal is, government is hesitant to pay its suppliers. Mm. Which I think is something we need, we need to pay back our debt. Yes, we are going to pay the foreign, and that, but this is also another internal debt that we need definitely uh, to, to, to pay up, to, to pay. And, and, and we need to control that too, because you ca can't keep on committing government even if you don't have money, uh, if, even if you don't have money. So there must be some disciplining accounting officers to stop committing government if you don't have money, in, uh, have money in the budget. The other part we have seen is that the escalating court losses due to uh, indiscipline among decision makers. You know, you are a board, you decided to fire your accounting officer, the guy walks to the court, comes out with a bill of, of 300 million Ugandan things. And you know these courts, they, know, they don't give fines of 10 million, mm. 100, 200. Even you make a decision against the advice of the Solicitor General. So these kind of court cases, these court awards are really escalating, it's just so, so high. So we need to make it have discipline in that if you make a very incompetent decision and we, you are likely to lose in the court, you should be responsible to pay that particular money. Especially after the going against the advice of the solicitor general, that you shouldn't do this and then you go ahead and, 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 and do it. So that's, I think that's one way of really curbing out our, our domestic, our domestic, uh, our domestic areas. areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you really, where we are as, as a country, I think, being a landlord also makes us a bit, gives us a number of challenges. Mm -hmm. And when you look at markets in the region, we are finding that actually we are trading at the surplus with all of them except mm -hmm. Tanzania, which I think for me is, 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 is a very good thing. And and what we major import from Tanzania actually are beans and rice, which I think actually we should be growing here mm -hmm. <laughs> to be able to offset that. But yes. I think as a country, where we are in the region is when you see uh, Rwanda, Rwanda has given us a number of headaches by closing the border. Mm -hmm. We need to find means of finding markets somewhere else. And the colleague was saying that if you're landlocked, you have no seaport. Mm -hmm. What do you have on your own mind? Mm -hmm. The only thing you have is railway. Mm -hmm. That means the gauge I don't believe in SGR by the way. That means the gauge railway. If we can rehabilitate it and it works properly, we can access access the markets. We by now, as a run look at the strategy would be to invest in the cargo, uh, air cargo. Because that is the only way you can get your goods out of here to another place in time. I was being given a story that Kenya as part of its attempt to benefit from the African trade, uh, African free Continental trade, mm. uh, Continental free trade area. Control, Continental free trade area, mm. wanted to export its goods from Nairobi to, to Accra, Ghana, and it took them three months. Mm. So it tells you that there could be market, but accessing it can actually be another mm. ball game. So as a nation, how are we prepared to tap into this African free uh, continental trade area? If you are not going to say, I think it's high time we think about cargo, we think about storage. We look at the airport, and I'm glad that we are trying to do that. But we need to speed up storage at the airport. So that if somebody says, I want tomatoes, they cannot, they shouldn't take three months. Otherwise, they will not be tomatoes. They will be rotten. <laughs> they will be rotten. Mm -hmm. They should take a very few, uh, very, 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 uh, very, very few hours. But I think we can address also that by looking at investing in the value chain. One of the big challenges we are going to face in the PDM is bumper harvest. Yeah. 90% of the people in the PDM are, are farmers. They are going to produce a lot of tomatoes, a lot of banana, bananas. Now, if we are not ready now to add value to them so they can stay longer, 
the next season people want to grow. And the market will sell them. And the market will sell them. They, they want. They will say, I can't produce a bunch of motoka and I sell it 500 shillings. Because that's what I'm, you have a milk and a liter is 200 shillings. You have no way to sell it. So, but as a government, right now, really, we need to be planning on what are we going to do with this bump harvest that is likely to come so that farmers are motivated to keep on producing more. I think that's right. Beautiful, beautiful. We are nearing the end of our interface. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll come to you, Rita. Um, what would be your last word to Ugandans and M others? My last word to Ugandans, but maybe to start with our own government. Um, first of all, I think it's a very good step that government has taken, seen through the lenses of this particular budget, but would like to see a government that planning, projections, and forecasting becomes part and parcel of our lives. We have a number of intergovernment agencies that have different responsibilities, but at the end of the day, they are all aimed to achieve a common goal. However, when it comes to the practice, you find that these government agencies are working in silos. I'll give you an example to illustrate that. The current issue we've been dealing with are medical pre-interns. 20, 25 years ago, probably we had Makere and maybe Mbarara and maybe one other producing doctors. And we did, for sure, somebody should have sat somewhere that come time T, we are going to have a certain number of doctors with over 10 universities now producing doctors. And these doctors will need to be absorbed in our hospitals as interns. And they'll have to be paid because it's in policy. How did we arrive in 2022 where we could not deploy doctors because we don't have money? Yes, you will blame COVID. But that is an illustration that we are not forecasting, we are not planning, we are not projecting. Population is growing. I'm told in the next uh, maybe 10, 15 years, we might be about 70 million. Who is, see, who is looking at these figures? Because even the quality of life, the quality of the services <coughs> that government is providing, if we do not project this growth of population yeah. in all ways, that growth is going to eat up. Oh. I'll give you another example. A few years ago, about four or five years ago, water, clean access to water, access, affordability, and availability, which is very essential, right from our homes, was at 70%. Now that has reduced to about 67, 68. Why? Because population, the population has eaten up the, the growth. So our planning, <coughs> forecasting, and really these agencies working and speaking to each other will do us good. Finally, to the citizens, government is us. And we need to participate and contribute. And how do we do that? One, we need to ensure our voices are heard. We need to engage civically in decision making. During this whole budget you know, process and the budget week, you'd hear people say, oh, this budget is not for us, they are not doing this. And I was like, but there's a whole budget cycle that we know when we should be participating. But besides that, are we engaging at the different levels? So we need, I know it's difficult, but we need to remain consistent. And then finally, is on the issues of the PDM, these opportunities. Let's capitalize on them and ensure that we do what is expected out of us so that the money can revolve to others. Thank, Thank you, Rita. Eunice? Well, uh, the main focus is still the accountability part on government expenditure. It's very important because that's, that happens to be an area where we apparently lose most of the money. But also uh, the focus on the systems in place to ensure that the proposed, for instance, small-scale 
solar powered irrigation schemes. That's a very good thing because we're using uh, sustainable and renewable energy. But if that irrigation scheme or all those irrigation schemes are implemented in a place where there's no water, that's a wastage of our money. And so these systems, the policies must be followed. They should be followed to the door to make sure that the implementation is done in places where we're going to reap as a nation. And uh, besides that, uh, to the citizens, there's plenty of hope. Uh, the, the, the budget has very many opportunities, if you take the time to read through. It has very many opportunities for us as citizens. Uh, like we talked about the parish development model, it's time for us as citizens to now engage. If you don't take a walk to talk to your LC1, this is the time to do it. Because there's plenty of time for you to do that, even on the weekend. And just ask these questions, because most of this information is available. but we do not attempt to look for it as, as citizens. If you just go and Google and go to the National Planning Authority, there's a wealth of information that will give lots of hope to know that government is doing the work. Yeah? And without knowing, you cannot then appreciate what is being done by government. Nothing can be perfect. And uh, just like the, the budget is funding some areas, and some areas we have to spend the debt, for instance, but let's focus on also the opportunities for growth because they are there. Beautiful. Yeah. Julius, um, your last word. Please. Yeah, my parting shots, really. I mean, two major things. One is uh, really for me is, is to congratulate the, the Minister of Finance for delivering this budget. Mm -hmm. I know the, it's, it's, it's not really easy to, to put up this document and you, know, you have to budget for, for Koboko and then you also budget for Chisoro and then each <laughs> and to be there. And it's not time now I think for us to even start saying, oh, I'm not there, I'm there and they are there. No, I think this is what we have. Mm. And, 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 and we need to really see how to do about it. The, the second point is uh, to the citizens of this country, and I, I have said it again that this money, small as it is, is what we have. Let's take advantage of that. Let's look at these opportunities. This money is not for the politicians or the minister of finance or the no. This is this is our money. That that hospital, that health centre, that borehole is for you. That no minister or member of parliament is going to use that borehole. Or will also go into that health centre or take their children to that UP school. It won't happen. That they are functional that depends on our active participation and demanding accountability. Government has put in place mechanism of transparency and accountability. For example, is that each and every delivery unit at the local must display their budget. And that's where we start from. To the extent that actually we display salaries and the pensions of people at the district level. You can't believe that. So our level of transparency is, is, is really top notch. We have a whole website of budget of Uganda. When you put there and say how much have we budgeted for Chisoro, you will find that in the, uh, you will be able to get that information. But our inability to engage and stand up and become active has given the opportunity for the corrupt to come and take our money. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you find a Julius Mukunda on a circle that is registered in Koboko. I mean, it, that is total corruption. <laughs> so, citizens, please, let's be vigilant and ensure that what has come to us, we actually receive it. If we don't do that, it's just going to be business as usual, opportunities will go away, and we shall come back here again and do the, the same stuff. And, and last year is to congratulate our private sector people. You know, me and you, how we have been trying to say, please, these things, it's not only for government, mm. this, this, this budget also affects you. Mm. And really, the, 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 the level of participation of the private sector, really, mm. the people had never thought of, you know, the, the auditors, the bankers, mm. now with the insurance per getting on. But I, mean, I, I think, really, the next two years, by the time oil comes, mm. <laughs> we'll, be we'll be there. Fine <laughs> we'll be thank you so much. All right, all right. Thank you, good people. Thank you, Rita. Thank uh, you. Rita from Uonet. Uh, Eunice from uh, Deloitte mm -hmm. and Julius uh, from, of course, CSBAG. Um, dear viewers, um, that has been, you know, uh, the focus on the budget 2023-2024, financial year budget, uh, here at Morning at NTV, a special edition supported by ABSA and uh, Deloitte. We're trying to look at how this budget affects you, but most importantly, how it's going to help us go into uh, next year or financial year for that matter, 
but most importantly, on, as you know, we take that journey as clearly spelled out in the National Development Plan 3. And after here, we're going to transition into our post-budget dialogue, which again we are doing with our partners here at the Victoria Hall at Serena. So stay tuned. We'll be picking that after uh, this interlude. Uh, we still have a lot packed for you, uh, a number of economists. We have government represented by the PSST. Uh, we have our friends from Uganda Revenue Authority also participating in the dialogue. And many experts, because we tr we're still trying to distill this budget even further so that you understand where you sit, the opportunities it presents for you especially, and how best, you know, we can move forward uh, with uh, uh, whatever we are doing. I've been your host, Charles Boji. Let's pick it from that after this brief interlude.